Okay, I think I can see any newcomers coming in. So jumping into the topic of salvation, the hows, the whats, the wheres, the, the hows, all that work. Anybody throw out a kind of a rough definition of just what it means to be saved? It does not have to be in the theological perspective, just saved in general. Well, um, let's see, to believe um, the Bible and that Jesus died for your sins, to repent and to take up your cross. Okay. Are you looking for like a, our sins have been atoned for? I'm just looking for a general definition of, of salvation, period. If somebody was drowning, what would, how would you describe salvation? Being saved. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know. So, uh, yeah, salvation, uh, I don't know. Yeah, being saved from our sin, ourselves. Okay. So being saved from something, from, from uh, injury, from condemnation, from isolation, being something bad that's about to happen, and there's some kind of an intervention to stop that. Yes. Make sense? Mm -hmm. We're starting with, with that definition. We're going like way back to very basics on it because we're framing up, laying foundation blocks for some of the other questions that we're, we're jumping into this week and next week. And then hopefully the week after that, we'll be um, back into the more regular lessons. We'll see how that goes. Okay. This is an experiment in Zoom, Zoom meetings. This is the second one I've done. I finished the last one like three minutes ago. So um, we tried to get in on that one and you didn't let us in. <laughs> yeah, my bad on that. I had my, I'm on a single screen. So I've got everything like packed into this and I had my notes sitting right on top of the place where it pops up that people are trying to join the meeting. <laughs> That's okay. That was all my bad. <laughs> okay. So was there a reason why my audio wasn't connecting? I don't know. Uh, on my end, it looked like you were there. I think it was probably. Your head. It was user what? I see like from. from <laughs> That could be my screen also. Um, okay. So no, I couldn't even tell who she was at the time. Hi, Lainey. Hi. Looking at what it means to be saved, generally being delivered from or rescued from or sprung from um, harm or condemnation or death or something bad and painful. So that piece is why we were looking at last week what humanity is, what we were designed to do, what we were designed to be, and what we became when we took the knowledge of good and evil for ourselves and fell to that temptation of trying to be like God himself and totally standing our own purpose on its head, um, becoming the exact opposite of what we were made for. We are made to reflect God's love and his, his justness and we end up reflecting ourselves because we took that knowledge of good and evil to ourselves. And in doing that, we become the exact, the, the antithesis of what our created purpose is. So the other piece of taking that knowledge to ourselves, we were designed to be walking this life something i'm in the basement and something just fell on the floor right above my head that sounded like it was falling through Don't worry, um we were designed to be in the garden with god walking beside him in that that communal relationship and then in one swift move all of a sudden instead of being side by side we're now opposing each other and because of that we look at Genesis 3, 22 through 24, the, the very first result of, of the fall. The Lord God said, since man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God sends man away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drives man out 
and station a cherubim and a flaming whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. So right there, all the way back in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible is that separation moment, that driving out from God's presence, holiness, righteousness, pure goodness cannot exist in the same place with uh, selfishness, self-interest, sin, death. They're, they're incompatible things, so humanity gets driven out of the garden. We are forbidden from taking the tree, the, the fruit of the tree of life, so that we won't live forever. And what is another way of saying we're not going to live forever? Is it's bedtime. See you, buddy. Immortal? We become mortal? Immortal. Well, yeah. Okay, so we were immortal if we ate of the tree of life. But because we're forbidden from that, we are now... Say it. Coronavirus might get us. We're now mortal. We are now subject, because of our sin, we are subject to death. Right? So now we see the peace that we need salvation from enter the picture here on how the world is worked. And if we look at Romans 6, we're going to be in, in Romans 6 tonight. If you get a chance to sit down and read Romans just chapter 1 through chapter 8 or chapter 9, there's, there's a very clear point in there where, where Paul takes a turn um, in his subject and what he's talking about. It's either chapter 9 or chapter 10. I can't remember. But if you get the chance to sit down and read that in one setting, the way it was written to be read in one setting, do and keep the conversation tonight in mind. Because we're looking at sin, we're looking at our situation through the lens of slavery. In Romans 6.23, he's laying out that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to look into what those pieces mean. So the wage of sin being death, we just quickly glanced off of that. We're forbidden to eat from the tree of eternal life because of our sin, which is another way of saying we're condemned to death. But the gift that comes from God, so we're contrasting what comes from sin and what comes from God. So the gift that comes from God is eternal life, and it is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So we're going to look at those two pieces. But the framing of that, all humanity begins as slaves, or all humanity exists as slaves, sorry. We're either slaves to our rebellious nature that we are born in, that nature with sin, the knowledge of good and evil that does not belong to us. Or we are slaves to righteousness. But that's not our natural condition. That's not what we're born in. We are born slaves to sin and death. When the inspired, when God is inspiring people to record his words, canonized in scripture, he's choosing words for a reason. They paint the, the best picture of the point that he's trying to get across. So when Paul's using the term slavery, we're going to look at that because it's, it's not a random word. It's great intentionality. What, what are slaves free to do and what are slaves not free to do? And you can look back at uh, you know the the type of slavery in in early American history for that. Think about that picture. What could a slave do, and what could a slave not do? Oh, you're saying like a slave could do whatever the master told it to, and or work, or the slave and the slave could not be free. Uh, do you mean stuff like a slave can't marry without his master's permission? A slave's it's part of it. So a slave, could a slave free themselves? Like, if they bought their freedom? 
what could they buy their freedom with? No, I guess money they've earned. Were slaves paid? Um, no, no, no. that's, 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 what, that's what that separates slave from servant. There you go. There's, there's some exceptions. There were a few slaves that were paid, but for, for the, the general definition of it, no, a slave doesn't earn an income. A slave has to do what the master tells them. A slave lives where the master tells them. A slave does what the master tells them. Everything that the slave uses to do the jobs that the master tells them belongs to the slave or belongs to the, the master, not the slave. Um, Slaves that had children, did the parents own the child or did the master own the child? Master. Could another phrase, could another slave free a slave? No, because they didn't have anything to purchase that, that slave out of slavery with. You could escape, maybe, but could you live a free life if you escaped? Depends on where you went. Could you turn around and walk off your master's property and then walk down the street in front of him? It was kind of a long way. No. Okay. That's the image that we're talking about when, when scripture is saying we are a slave to sin and death as the condition that we are born in. We are trapped. We belong whole hearted lock stock barrel to sin and death there's nothing that we can do to free ourselves from that situation or nothing we can do to save ourselves from that situation so bring that that word of salvation in to our situation we have nothing of our own we're not our own we have to do what the master says this Sin is the master over our life, and that leads to death. And there's no way out of that. Following with me so far? Yeah. Okay. So scripture says we are enslaved to sin. That's our rebellious nature when, that we talked about last week. Adam and Eve bring that into existence, just like the slave that has children. The children belong to the master, not the parents. That is how it that that bondage perpetuates down through the human race generation after generation and i've got a piece of notes that's a little bit out of order here but i'm gonna i'm gonna throw this out because paul is contrasting living under two different masters as he's talking about the our salvation through christ romans 6 16 do you not know that whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are that one's slave? Whether sin is leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. And I've stuck this in the wrong note. It's more a, uh, in the wrong place in my notes. It's more a piece about life after salvation. It does tie into before, but... That first part, um, whoever we present ourselves to as slaves to obey is who we are enslaving ourselves to, is what's being said there. Um, it's more the slave that has been purchased out of slavery but still looks to their old master for direction, guidance, and so forth. I'm throwing that out there now because I want some help bringing that back. I stuck it in the wrong place. I didn't have time to move it. We are, we are enslaved to sin at birth by the condition of our birth. We're not paid in wages, so we've got nothing of value that we can exchange for it. Um, and there is no other slave out there, no other slave to sin and death that has anything that they can exchange with our master to purchase our freedom out. And we're kind of... Oh. Go ahead. Oh, never mind. Sorry, I just got a notification on the screen. Uh, and we are enemies of the other master. Right. 
No. Our master is enemies with the other master. So in this world of slavery, there are two masters. Those two masters are opposed. We are owned lock, stock, and barrel by one. And that ain't good. Um, and the other is pure and holy and righteous and just. So the idea of a prison break is out of the picture also because that other master is holy and righteous and just, and that is in legal terms, that would be stealing. True. And we're so, willing slaves. Yes. We that's a whole nother subject. So how then in that situation can a person be saved? How can a slave under that master of sin and death get out of that situation? Um, the other master has to uh, uh, the other master has to buy it by you. A purchase or an exchange to do it a, in a right and just way. There would have to be a purchase or an exchange, something of value traded for the slave that belonged to the other master. And only another free being could purchase a slave, right? One slave can't buy a slave from another master. That just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So another free master has to be the one that pays the price for a servant to free them from the bondage of the other master. The legal exchange there. But if the wages of our own sin are death, what price has to be paid to get our freedom? Um, is death or um so I'm kind of confused. Okay. Um, so the price for our freedom. All right, we're slaves to death, and you want to know the, um, what has to be paid for our freedom? Yeah, if we rephrase it a little bit, if we are slaves to death, then our life was the price paid. It takes a life to purchase us from freedom. From, uh, from slavery to sin. It takes a life to purchase us from slavery to sin. And so that, a life for a life. Yeah, and that's the imagery that was set up in the, the Levitical laws. The temple sacrifice system was that image that your sin costs a life. That's also the image that's set up in the garden when, when God kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden. The first thing he did was create clothes for them from animal skins it was a life that was paid to cover a sin never thought about that so our freedom from the bondage of sin and death costs a life so if a good and just master is trying to buy us from sin and death what's the price that has to be paid the cost. The cost. And that cost is? Life. A life. Pure and just sacrifice for pure, uh, the, the payment of a pure and just life for another. That's not, um, not so pure. <laughs> not so. Yeah. Just. That's a bad trade, isn't it? Yeah. Not so much. Yeah. Not, not. Not getting your money's worth out of that one. No. Uh -uh. That, that little piece speaks to God's character and how much God really loves us because he took a bad deal to purchase us out of our enslavement to sin and death. But then let me ask you this one. If he's the master and he just died, who do we belong to? Think of this. You've got two warring slave owners, and one of them reaches out 
to make a purchase from the other, mm-hmm. buy a slave. And in that transaction, the one master dies. Who's the slave end up belonging to? Well, if I was the living master, I know who the slave would end up belonging to. If you were the living master and you were the, the same living master who is unjust and unfair and self-seeking and self-serving, who owns that slave again? Well, I mean, the owner's <laughs> gone. I mean, what can you do, right? You gotta keep keepers. <laughs> yeah, the transaction and uh, we signed the paperwork and then the guy died. So I guess you're still mine. Sorry. Exactly. So we just went from Good Friday to Sunday to Easter Sunday. Then what happens in this legal transaction that's going on? Good master comes back. The resurrection happens. So the idea, we see it sometimes in the movies where the, the good guy gets beat up and he stands back up like, that all you got? That happens to me in real life too, though. So. Does it? It's yeah. all that working out that you've been doing. Yeah, yeah. I, I see Stephanie thought that was very, for some reason. <laughs> it's me. I mean, he might work out. But <laughs> not I'm not laughing at you uh, when I'm laughing with you. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm sure. Getting beat up. Sure. <laughs> Something like that. Um. Okay. So back to this is the whole kind of good friday to easter morning thing we have the good and just master who pays the exorbitant price takes the terrible deal lays down his own life to purchase us out of sin and death the situation that we're in and enslavement to this evil master and in that moment that friday moment that saturday moment before the resurrection happens you can get the idea why why the disciples were hiding. Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. Um, this whole salvation thing that they thought they understood clearly doesn't look like it's going to work. I mean, died, so yeah. yeah. That wouldn't be too helpful, helpful or hopeful. Yeah, this one, this good and just slave, or not slave, this good and just master that we've been talking about is buried away in a tomb now. So for the Friday and the Saturday, this looks like defeat. But Easter morning, we get that, that, that pinnacle movie moment where the good guy comes back up, stands up, and almost like, is that all you got? Knowing good and well that death really was all that death has. That's the big gun. You fired your big gun. All right, I'm back. What else have you got? Not much. So not only do we have the purchase of ourselves, the price that was paid for the wages of sin and death, but we also have the moment where death is defeated. So salvation, there's the salvation on the personal level. There's also the the magnitude of that how secure is that salvation we were a master we were a slave to this master over here by the trap of death that sin brings and this master over here just beat death not only did he pay for my sins but he also just beat death there's nothing death has left that can take me back over an enslavement all of that wrapped up in the life the death the resurrection moments um so there's the piece when we jump to the the question that somebody asked can you go to heaven if you don't believe in christ if that is the exchange and it is Is there another way back to God as your master? You got to be perfect and have never sinned in your life. <laughs> Stephanie.
Stephanie, you and I both know we ain't going. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> no. you win. I guess I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. Alvin, what about you? Who said what? <laughs> I asked Calvin, what about him? Okay. <laughs> So here's the thing, one of the things about that question, um, can you go to heaven if you don't believe in Christ? A lot of times it comes into a, um, comes into a conversation from somebody who doesn't, doesn't believe in scripture, doesn't believe in God. Um, they may believe in a different God. They may have a different view of the world. And a lot of times it is framed from the idea of, well, if God is all loving and all good, then surely he made more than one way to heaven. Because an all good and all loving God wouldn't condemn anybody. But what if you deserve it? So, yeah, he, um, loving God and just God. Okay, so... God is a just God, not just all loving and all good, but he's also just. Mm -hmm. But Wyatt, you had a, what you said, what if you deserve it? Yeah, because we do. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, there, there's a but little. It's also said there's only one way to get through the Father. Only one way to get through the Father, and that's through me. Mm-hmm. Well, without whose, whose action condemned us, ours. So yeah. that's yeah, we did we deserve hell. That's what I'm saying though. That's why a, a loving God doesn't just let everybody in because they've earned what they've got. Yeah, and here's the crazy piece: you flip that question around from God's point of view. It's amazing that He made one way for us to be yeah actually i think it's merciful that he made one way yeah mm -hmm. so it's not confusing it's just not believable because it's so easy yes and one way is like i don't understand why anyone like why would you need another way yeah why would you need another way well, yeah well there's some it really comes from the human point of view and from, again, that that inner sin of being the judge of right and wrong. You're essentially saying, I'm sorry, God, the death of your son on the cross wasn't enough for me. In, in my mind, you should do something else. Is the or other... In my mind, I should do something else or I should do something else, or there should be another way, or maybe you didn't, God, maybe you didn't think of, what about if I do this? You paid that price. Yeah, maybe I believe it. Maybe I won't, but I want to, I want to go this way and do it my way. Well, that's right back to original sin, isn't it? Trying to be the definition of good and of, of right and wrong, good and evil in and of ourselves, which again is not ours to be. That was, that was all God's. Mm -hmm. But the part that blows my mind away is knowing the cost that was paid, knowing how bad a deal it was for Christ to trade his life for mine, that he did. You know, it's astounding to me that, that God would create one way even one, not just only one. The, the, the astounding part is they created even one way because none of us deserve it. I know, yeah. <laughs> he went through a lot of work and a lot of pain because also think about this. God speaks the world into existence, right? Mm -hmm. He spoke the universe happened. He spoke the grass grew. He spoke animals happened. He spoke, we happened. What is expensive to God? Nothing, I guess. If Not much. Not much. <laughs> if he wanted to make a whole world out of gold, 
Cool. Gold planet. Boom, there it is. But what was expensive to God? Mm. What's the one thing God didn't create? Himself. What's the one price that God paid for you and me? Himself. Yeah. That is the one way that he created. Simmer on that for a minute. Yeah. How big a deal is that? Pretty big. Like, a little too big for my words, I think. Yeah. And then some people will turn around and say, well, I think there's another way. I think there's several other ways to get to heaven or all religions lead to heaven. That one's a real popular one right now. Um, mm, all, all religions are really talking about God. And so there's all kinds of ways to heaven. If the God of the universe paid that price, do you think there really is any other way? Would he have gone to that pain? Would he have gone through that pain if there was another way? No. We, oh. see that, we, we even see that argument with himself in, in the garden when Jesus is praying, uh. Lord, if there is any other way, take this cup from me, but not my will, yours. He knows full well what that pain is, what that cost is. So that's why I say when we bring that question up, it becomes kind of self-evident when you, you walk through and crawl through the other, the, the whole pieces of salvation there. So then back the idea of having a master, a shift from the word slavery and being enslaved to having a master, because we have a good and just and kind master who wants only the best for his entire creation. And we are freed from a master who wanted death from his creation, from God's creation, wanted to kill God's creation, everything in it. How do we know that we've changed masters? Well, I guess instead of serving sin and sinning, we serve righteousness. And so we produce, um, he through us produces righteous fruit fruits. Okay. You kind of tried to answer the whole questionnaire in one thing, which well done by the way. Um, but yeah, the, the, the first piece of it, because we are still in bodies that have sin. We are not fully sanctified until our bodies are dead and we are given new ones. Until we are restored in heaven. I think about it, this is, this is, this is my mental image because I'm a, a pictures and image kind of guy. We can't go back to the garden until our bodies are back sin-free. That very thing that separated us from God, the very thing that made us be driven out of the garden, that all has to be fixed. My image of heaven is stepping back into the garden. Right. Um, but it's even better. Even better. My, my back doesn't hurt anymore. My body's restored. There's hair that grows, you know, everywhere that's supposed to and not in the places it's not. Um, the fact that now we've actually been out of the garden and have sinned, um, it glorifies God even more that he's given us salvation than if we just had salvation and we'd never sinned and God had never, like in the beginning. Do you get what I'm saying there? I do. There's, there's a piece of God that gets reflected that wouldn't have otherwise because God's so like God's grace, God's forgiveness. If there wasn't something to forgive, none of those things would be evident. Yeah. Um, how do you know that a slave, back to the original question, how do you know that a, a servant has changed masters? He, oh, because they chase after the different things. 
whatever this master changed after, if I'm not owned by this one anymore, I'm owned by this master over here, I'm going to be pursuing the things that this master holds dear. If you're a slave to sin, you sin. If you're a slave to righteousness, you pursue righteousness. Right. We don't... Somebody's trying to get back in. Wesley got bumped off of the meeting. We don't achieve righteousness through our own actions and we can't attain righteousness in full righteousness in these bodies but as we pursue the righteous master he can work all things for good you've heard that quote before god works all things for good for those who love him yeah that's the image right there as we we strive to chase after the good and righteous God, we, try, we strive to chase after the good and righteous master in sinful, broken bodies, still messing things up in a sinful, broken world. God reaches in and kind of stirs those things around to, to work those things for good. Mm -hmm. He knows the heart of those who are chasing him and in his grace and his forgiveness and his desire for his grace and goodness to be reflected in the world he reaches in and does those things that is not a license to sin that's also one of the it's six seven and eight all three topics that's in romans um if you've changed masters you're it's not you're not <laughs> licensed to so sin. you will serve the other master that's how right you're do are we to sin more though so that God's right, right. Yeah, God's grace so, may more abound, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so like we're supposed to pursue God and we're gonna mess things up enough for his righteousness. Yeah, to, yeah. We don't need to worry about trying to make him more great to forth to abound. Yeah. Go ahead. It comes when when what happens to a slave when he breaks the rules? The slave gets corrected. In a, how does he get corrected? In, in like, in what manner does he get corrected? <laughs> like, like, it's also a big topic in Scripture that God disciplines His children. He knows we screw up, but just like a parent disciplines their child for their own good, God disciplines His children. Because he, after paying that price with his blood, with his son, he doesn't look at us as slaves. He looks at us as children, which is another mind-blowing concept in all of that. And because he looks at us as children, he corrects us and disciplines us as a parent, which is a goal of not punishing, but a goal of inserting correction and 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 growth and maturing of the child mm -hmm. that's yeah. the question you're asking or the answer you were trying to throw out yeah i guess yeah so kind of the whip usually not the whip while we are still enemies with god he will bring the whip with the idea of driving us to our knees because people turn to god in our low points so a merciful and grace, um, yeah, a merciful God, a merciful master. Yeah, because think about it, think about it this way. Um, if the goal of the master is to, to drive correction and, and take that servant and just realign them with his goals and his purposes, mm -hmm. If that necessitates a painful lesson, that master is not going to just open the floodgate and, and inflict pain because it brings him joy to do it. He's inflicting just enough pain to get the correction that needs to happen. Well, and like when you, when you tell your kids, don't touch that, it's hot, don't touch that, it's hot, don't touch that, it's hot, but they have no concept of what hot is. Right. Well, you might warm up a mug of, of coffee you're going to test it and you make sure it's not something that's going to cause a burn 
it'll cause that sensation of heat and and let the child touch it and say that's hot don't touch because now they have a concept of what hot is and they can avoid the real heat that's going to hurt them and so you when think about that brings brings pain or brings a painful lesson to fruition mm -hmm. it is still with that goal of long-term working for good yeah They're like a spanking it stings at the moment but it brings that message of that's off limits well, no pain no gain That brings up a good point too of of our own hearts and our own attitudes. If we can choose, you know, when we get stubborn, look at it from the other way. When we are extremely stubborn people, it takes some painful lessons to correct us. But if we have hearts that are willing to be corrected, it doesn't take that much pain. Yeah. If, if we let the master guide us, it doesn't hurt as much. And also the point about slaves being whipped, it's important to realize that, of course, Christ took on sins, past, present, and future. So he was already whipped for us. Yeah. And that imagery of whipping, too, is a, a good way to contrast the two masters. Yeah. Okay, but then also still um we're since we're still prone to sin a lot of times um you know we don't always see like you know what i mean where he's trying to point our attention to yes that's why you're supposed to examine yourself as we look at that how do i know i'm saved or how do we know uh, we never really know if somebody else is saved until we meet them in heaven. Um, but because there are some really fabulous liars in the world. But scripture talks about looking at the fruit and how the fruit gives testimony to what the the plant is. You know, a, a, an apple on a tree gives testimony that that set of roots over there that this apple is attached to, that's an apple tree. We know it's an apple tree. Why? Because it bears an apple or a, you know, an orange tree bears an orange. So that fruit testifies to what the tree is. Likewise, our fruit in life testifies to who our master is. That's the call to bear fruit. To, that's the call to do good works. It's not because it is involved with the act of being saved, but it's involved with the act of testifying who our master is. Yes. That is our, our works that we do day to day is our fruit. The question is what tree does our fruit testify that we belong to are of? Or what master does our fruit testify that we belong to? Yeah. Um, but like, you know, so since we're still prone to sin, sin, don't we technically still produce bad fruit sometimes? Yep. And that's why he, he punished, that's why he brings us back to repentance. Think of our Sunday school lessons that we've had before we, we left each other. God always brings people back to a place of repentance. So he's going to correct because he loves you and it brings you back to a place of repentance that, that re realigns you and restores you. You are constantly working towards being more like God, being more like Jesus. It says in first Corinthians in that love chapter that we won't know until we are face to face. Just like David said, we are not going to fully be perfect, fully know anything until we are face to face we are constantly being sanctified until the day we stand with him and so when he corrects us he's going to redirect us and he's going to bring us to repentance i'm trying to find the bible verse i thought it was in psalms but he asks for us to examine ourselves against the word so that we know when we are sinning and if we don't spend time in the word no you don't know what you're sinning you can miss your sin because you're not spending time in the word because we're that stupid 
Bible calls us sheep for a reason. <laughs> and we and, and cattle would not be a far one off either. We were driving, <laughs> driving by really the other day and they had been burning grass off and and we had the whole family in the car and one of my kids say, Is that cow eating burning grass? <laughs> Yes. After it's burnt, it has great nutrition. No, 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 no. no it was still. <laughs> <That's> totally lying. On <laughs> fire. Let's go. Yes, it was still burning. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Cows are not dumber than sheep. <laughs> They're pretty dumb, though. So yes, Wyatt. In our we we still have sin in us. We are still prone to that. Um prone to wander and yet in his patience his mercy his grace god still reaches down with the the rod back to that shepherd analogy thy rod and thy staff comfort me the uh the staff was used to pull sheep out of the predicaments they got themselves into the staff was used sometimes to nudge them back onto the path sometimes to defeat enemies that were coming to them but that that staff for whatever purpose the good shepherd was using it for was good. Stephanie, was that the fifth pound of I found it or was that the Yes. Psalms 139.23. It's also in Corinthians 13 5. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I wasn't so that this pound five while you're there. Can you read that? 13.5? Yeah. Please. Come yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do, not, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in, is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I test that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not so that people will see that you will see that we have stood the test but so that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. You want him to keep going? No, that's good. I was, sorry, I'm, where my eyes are at over here, I'm, I'm watching Owen's face. <laughs> well, well, I thank you. I thought everyone was. Well, yeah, since you've been working out this time. <laughs> keep pushing your brother to the Thanks. side. I like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> Why does everyone find that so funny? <laughs> it's not funny. They need to take it serious, Ellen. Very. Yeah. Right, but it's until you see me, I've like, you know, just a cup. Like, um, I, I've gained at least two inches in muscle. Just, he's getting big. <laughs> yeah. that, it's, it's, we miss that, seeing you. We have no idea. Yeah. Is that context for that scripture? ring clear to you owen okay yeah we're, we're essentially called to examine our own fruit are we and examine our own fruit and just um about said justify um judge are we bearing the fruit of christ or are we bearing some other fruit and if we're bearing some other fruit then we have a correction to make it's not our salvation, it's our fruit. And that prayer, I pray that you do everything perfect, not that you would be glorified, but that, that God would be glorified. That your fruit, the prayer for you to do everything perfect was that so that your fruit would then testify to God who, are, who you are now grafted into that tree. Good news. Owen oh, oh, has, it is, Fabulous news. <laughs> yes, I'm very happy about it. I love trying to read Owen's face. He's, I'm, I'm afraid if we ever try to play poker or something like that. <laughs> I, I have a real fascinating face. It's... Yeah. What other thoughts have you got floating out there? We're, we're over time, but Zoom hasn't cut it off. So right. we're going to talk more about the. Um, one of the questions how do i know for sure that i am saved 
Um, and there's two pieces of that. The, the, the big, the key piece of it, how do I know for sure that I'm saved is because God said so. Mm -hmm. When, you know, when God speaks, it happens. Yeah. And God does not make a promise and then take it back that front to back from Genesis to revelation. That is God's character. That's God's nature. It's not just choices that he makes, but that's who he is. He speaks things into existence and he never betrays his word. So if God says we are saved through Christ, then that's it. We know we are because he said so. But a lot of times when people are asking that question, how do I know that I'm saved? They're really coming at it from, I don't feel like I'm saved or I don't, um, I want to see evidence that I'm saved. What kind of evidence am I looking for? What kind of evidence should there be in my life? Um, and that is, they're looking for experiences that they can point to, to kind of, to strengthen their faith in the fact that they're saved. Um, so it's really two different things. How, how can you be confident that you're saved because God said so, but yes, there is also evidence in your life. And we're going to, we're going to look at those two pieces. Um, cause they also, it also plays into some of the other questions that get into behavior personal behaviors. Why should I not do this thing? Why should I, why should I do this other thing over here? And, and that ties all back into the fruit mm -hmm. and the purpose and the price that was paid for us in the, and honoring and chasing after the, the one who paid that price. what his intent was behind those actions what because because those actions the institution of marriage you know marriage and family those two institutions were part of creation they were before the fall they have a purpose and so we start to look at those things and we start to the answers to more and more of those questions about our own day-to-day -day personal behaviors start to come out of those when we look at them from the Genesis worldview. So what things have we got going on? I love that they haven't cut us off, but I'm going to have to because we're over time. <laughs> it's, it's locking the door. Actually, we normally go till nine o'clock, so maybe we're not over time. No, 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 we're, we're not yet. Not. It's really nice to be able to actually, um, see you guys and actually hold a conversation uh, i've really just missed you guys you... me too we've totally missed you totally yeah. missed you guys well i knew you guys were missing me um except <laughs> maybe stephanie might not have but yeah. uh, i missed you owen i totally missed you <laughs> uh, um i feel trying though to come up for wyatt with a song as he enters the room i was going to yeah. play something as you go out tonight i've got like you know, a Glenn Miller or a, um, you know, another one song for you. I'll think about it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> but, Lainey, were you surprised the other day when we circled around and said happy birthday to you? Yeah. <laughs> we got you on that one? Yeah. I, I would have been there, but I had to get to work. So happy birthday. Thank you for Lainey's. I, I, I made your Facebook post, but I, I couldn't car there because I had to be at work. So <laughs> I was glad to see that you got to drive for it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that my my driving story was not quite as bad as yours, but you know how you guys can get your permit at 15 and a half and you can start driving then? Yeah. You know when that happened? The day before my 16th birthday. <laughs> you had no experience. <laughs> oh, I had tons. We lived out in the country. And oh. Right. I think I was three and a half feet tall when I started driving. <laughs> but 
as far as legally being able to drive on the road. The day before my 16th birthday is when they started letting people drive at 15 and a half years old. 